uh, now we are going to hear from Joe Bess Lacroix from uh, Retro. Well, thanks so much, Martin and Alex Z. I don't know if you're around, but this is like, what do we think of this conference so far? So, yeah. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> I agree. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Joe betz -Lacroix. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I'm a CEO of a small startup in Redwood City, California, near San Francisco. And today I'll be talking about what reprogramming parabiosis and autophagy have in common. Do we have any guesses? You can, you can see. Um, so our mission, uh, which will not be lost on you, is to add 10 years to healthy human lifespan. I get a lot of mm, criticism of, of that mission uh, because a lot of people say, why are you picking such a short amount of life extension? Um, come on, go for something real. And then the other half of the people say, this is ridiculous. Um, how could you possibly do such, an, such a, um, a difficult feat? But this is our sweet spot. Um, so what do these things have in common? Uh, for one thing, six criteria that we apply to things that we work on at Retro. What does it take to get into the company? And one of them is that we were an aging biology company, died in the wool, has to be an aging mechanism related to it. And um, also we are impatient. So, um, I mean, I think it's very noble, a lot of the things people are working on that slow aging, but we're, we're looking for things that reverse aging and rejuvenate. Um, also, because we are a, a like action-oriented company doing translation, we want to make sure that there is something close to human. I think uh, we are in great debt to all of the amazing academic research that's been done in ancient cell types, like yeast and worms and flies and, and uh, zebrafish even. Um, but being translational, uh, we want things that are as close to human as possible. And so that has to be a mammal for us. Um, also has to be some plausible means of intervention. So, um, you know, if you have to germline modify your human in order to in, in create this effect, uh, anti-aging effect in them, um, that could be part of our, you know, kind of cool, creepy future uh, for later generations, but um, being impatient, um, we want to create medicines for people alive today. And uh, also in concordance with our mission, we want to be able to treat large amounts of people for long periods of time. And the reality of the 2020s, regulatory environments, et cetera, um, and un untested medicines, we have to cure diseases. Um, controversially, I would say that aging isn't a disease, and you can beat me up afterwards um, if you disagree with me, but, or I'm happy to debate it in a civilized fashion. Um, but uh, we, expect to produce cures for diseases related to aging mechanisms and then let there become a body of evidence supporting the idea that whatever medicine is safe enough that the use can expand ultimately to being preventative. And that's what it takes to create 10 years of healthy lifespan, extremely widespread use. Um, we're not into creating things for Billionaires, we don't want to discriminate against billionaires. I'm just saying we don't want therapies that are super expensive and awkward and difficult to implement and only a few people can afford to use them. So that's another criterion. They have to be become like distributable therapeutics. So what are the commonalities between these things in the title of this talk between reprogramming and autophagy? They're both cell autonomous, fundamentally, um, between autophagy and plasma, um, which is what I'm referring to by para parabiosis. Um, they're deeply engaged in the proteome, at least the way we're working on it. And the way we're working on it, reprogramming and plasma, we're working heavily in blood for our partial reprogramming efforts. Uh, so to that, I have the 
um, intimidating honor of following Jean-Marc uh, like a global reprogramming expert. Um, and I probably don't need to recapitulate all of that because he just explained a bunch of it to you. But very quickly, Yamanaka 2006, the really cool thing about being able to create pluripotent stem cells from adult like skin cells is that two amazing things happen um, that normally only happen during reproduction, which are that one, the cells change fate from skin to, or whatever, to being these stem cells, and they lose all of their age. They become zero age again, because, I mean, babies, like this, this thing that happens over and over again, and um, uh, like it's very clearly definable that babies are zero age um, initially. So the, the question then is, is there some way, like for us in the aging biology field, is there some way, um, and Jean-Marc presented a bunch of these ways, that th those two phenomena can be uncoupled? So that you can have some of the age wiped away, but not have all of your identity wiped away so that you become a pile of stem cell protoplasm and die. Uh, this is sort of a, this is a diagram showing some indirectly, um, some work of Nelly Alova that uh, you can track the age as you take cells through the reprogramming time course. You can, uh, on a day-by-day -day basis, that's the x-axis, you can watch their methylation, methylation age go down. That's the purple. Um, you can watch their sort of pluripotency-like gene programs go up. If you go too far, like that red dotted line, then maybe you've uh, irrevocably altered this tissue in a way where it can't function anymore. Um, fast forward to 2016, probably another Nobel Prize happening in here. Um, our advisor, Alejandro Ocampo, figured out that, well, let's say you don't do this Yamanaka reprogramming continuously and create a pile of protoplasm, but instead you just do a little burst, um, just a couple days. And if you only go that far, then amazing things happen. He showed in mammals, our criterion, that there are rejuvenated phenotypes, a bunch of different rejuvenated phenotypes, and they, they uh, they don't end up getting cancer or uh, having other things that destroy their bodies. So that's like, what? We can just reprogram cells and, and entire bodies and not kill animals and not, um, probably not kill people? That's incredible. This is a whole new branch of biology. Um, since then, a bunch of labs all over the world have replicated this in various different tissues of various different phenomena, uh, phenotypes, age-related um, characteristics that are reversed um, to a more youthful phenotype in muscle, heart, lung, skin, liver, optic nerves and eyes, even brains. Um, like mice have seem to have better memory if you partially reprogram them. And for the work that we're doing in partial reprogramming, T cells. Having more youthful T cells turns out to be very useful because T cells, the immune system itself is, is uh, such a fundamental part of the body. Like if you go any direction on average in a tissue within about three cells, you'll hit an immune, immune cell. Um, so here's a sneak peek at some of the early data from our work in Redwood City. If we have human donor T cells um, that in this case are um, in a particular ratio of different, the CD8 T cells have all these different subtypes that have different capabilities and characteristics. Um, and the control cells have mostly effector and exhausted, ter terminally exhausted phenotypes and very few naive and central memory. And then after a couple of different combinations of reprogramming types that we do to them. Um, we've shown a couple here. Um, that ratio is reversed, and we have a much larger pool of naive and central memory T cells, which is really useful because T cells are what protect us from cancer 
especially, and many other things. Um, and having them be, their ability to expand huge amounts, like a thousand fold and attack something, um, is dependent on their having the, the earlier in these differentiation cascades. Um, so that's going well. We have another program in autophagy. Autophagy, autophagy is, is one of these things like, uh, like, I don't know, like the nutraceutical vendors will try to convince you that oxida all oxidation is bad in the body and that you should take antioxidants and the antioxidants will solve all of your problems. Um, but it turns out that it's actually a lot more complicated than that and oxidation in its various forms is critical for being alive, even for T cells functioning. Um, autophagy similarly is incredibly complex because it's basically every single broken thing or unused protein, et cetera, has to get broken down and reused, um, made into its component parts and reused inside the cell. So there's a lot of different mechanisms for that. But in just one of those, we have found a target that is related to A, some aging phenotypes, some important long-term aging issues. And there happens to be a more acute disease um, that is also related uh, to a failure of this kind of autophagy. And so we have found a lead molecule that we're working with that we're very excited about, RTR242. Um, and in a, a mouse model of this human disease, um, you can see in the red, um, in a particular metric of muscle performance, um, when we treat with RTR242, uh, it, it uh, rescues that phenotype um, to be uh, statistically indistinguishable from healthy. On the plasma parabiosis side, uh, I guess we had a, a really nice description of that uh, a little bit earlier. Um, Lou, I, um, Lou Hawthorne may still be here. Um, um, the uh, history of that, which he already described, is that you do this kind of grisly thing where you like sew together an old animal and a young animal. And um, he was talking about the old animal, the younger animals getting older, but also the, the old animals get younger. Um, and that's pretty remarkable. Uh, it's, it's a little less clear how you intervene. Uh, so how, how do we make that into satisfying one of those criteria for things that we want to work on at Retro? Um, but then later we were also inspired by some results from Convoy Lab at Berkeley where they were able to only take plasma out and showed some rejuvenated phenotypes, um, as Lou mentioned as well. Uh, and then I just want to put a plug in here for Vadim Gladyshev. You may be in the house, um, incredible scientist, one of our advisors. Um, in his group, uh, they showed that you can detach the parabionts, as you call them, um, after a few months, and then the, the older ones uh, continue to have a rejuvenated phenotype uh, afterward, which is pretty exciting. So we don't really want to have, again, these old billionaires having to pay the young um, plasma donors to come give them donations because that violates one of our tenets. Um, so we're not doing that. Um, we're making medicines. Um, and how do we make medicines out of this? Well, so I, I think that what Lou was saying is that pretty much all of the effect of the heterochronic parabiosis seems to be the kind of the red side, like the taking out of the bad things. Um, we replicated the convoys experiments. Uh, we repeated them, I'd say, with a larger N, um, like number of animals in the groups and so on, under extremely carefully controlled and blinded conditions, um, and not all of it replicated. Um, so we don't feel as strongly that everything would be on the red side of like taking, you know, take the bad stuff out of the old animal. Um, we think that there is um, a, a bunch of utility in the what is the good things that come from the young animal as well. Um, we, here's some of our data um, that for the things that 
do recapitulate um, from removing old plasma. You can see that liver fibrosis, uh, the young animals, um, the, in yellow, the older animals have much more liver fibrosis. And um, after the plasma removal treatment, um, they're much closer to young. And similarly for muscle fibrosis, the um, fibers, the muscle fibers, after you damage a muscle and let it reheal um, in an old animal, they tend to get replaced with these kind of thinner fibers of the muscles. Um, and for the uh, treated animals, um, they're much closer to the young animals there. Statistically significant. So I guess the, the trite answer to what's the commonality between all three of these phenomena is retro. Um, we are, um, like I say, a, a startup going after aging writ large in Redwood City. We have an initial funding of $180 million, which will last us minimally for 10 years of our work. Uh, we got going immediately by converting 40 shipping containers in a giant warehouse, 23,000 square foot facility into lab spaces, um, one of which is depicted in the background. Um, we're 21 people about to be 22 in a couple days. We've had our lab running for 12 months. We have three programs, one team, and probably, I guess about 0.25 of me is bureaucracy, so I'm rounding down. Um, I'm calling it zero bureaucracy. Um, but that's, that's what we're up to. Um, we are challenging ourselves um, to have a clinical trial in our partial reprogramming in humans by 2026, and a couple of different trials in our plasma program, one next year for the discovery process and in 2025 for efficacy, and in our autophagy program, a clinical trial next year. We will have approved therapeutics in patients before the end of the decade. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, here's our crew um, sitting on top of the lab. Um, if you uh, will be doubling roughly in the next year. So uh, if you're interested in joining a team, uh, look, check out our careers page and we will be excited to talk to you. Super cool. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Joel. Um, we have time for maybe one question. If, uh, if we have some in the audience, it's late, so people are... Um, we have one from Lou. Well, that was great. Um, I'm really inter interested in the nuts and bolts of building companies. And the shipping container idea is fantastic. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about how the, if, if it's modular and how you're, you're dividing that up by the science projects you're doing. And just anything you want to say about this crazy idea, because I think it's wonderful. that I'm on. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, yeah, so here's how it works. We, um, we're, we created a separate facility over in Oakland. Uh, we brought in shipping containers. We had plasma cutters cut out the sides. Um, so we used 20-foot high cube shipping containers, um, cut out the complementary sides, um, bolt them together, uh, not quite bolt them together there, and then put interiors on with you know, metal studs, insulation, drywall, um, electrical, ventilation, lighting, windows, etc., and then ship them over to Redwood City to our lab, bolt them together, put them down, screw them to the concrete. Um, then we built our own HVAC system and connected all the ventilation, wiring, and so on. Uh, so each one is, you know, like, what is it in meters, like say, 9 by 12 meters or something like that. Um, 10 by... Um, that, it feels like a pretty nice spacious lab. Like, what do you guys think? Like, if, we have uh, what do you think, Alex? What's it like being inside a retro lab? Yeah, that's good. They're, they're, they're labs. They feel like it's awesome. Yeah, he, he didn't have a mic. Um, um, do what? Yes, they're absolutely. We could, we could vacate this warehouse um, probably in a week to some other warehouse because uh, they unbolt and then they go on trucks. Um, we can take them anywhere we need to. Thanks so much. Like, uh, 
Breaking fat science. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, uh, Joe. That was really fantastic. Uh,